please join me in welcoming Daniel Reich. Good evening. Thank you, Professor Kamrava, for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to edit this book. Um, the publisher actually sent us two different book covers, uh, one with Mo Salah and another one with Erdogan playing football. Uh, I responded within a few minutes and said that I would prefer Mo Salah. Um, so Susie Mirgani from uh, your staff uh, noticed that it's all about men here, a male football player and male uh, sitting around and two male also. So uh, for gender equality reasons, we also have uh, women practicing sport on the back of the book, which is uh, Haya al Shayan, winner of the 2015 Battle of the East CrossFit competition in Kuwait. Um, Last year at a conference, a colleague told me uh, that it's stupid to have the Twitter address on the last slide, something which I did until then. So from now on, it's on the first slide. Um, and I would start with uh, giving some uh, background information about uh, this uh, book and uh, project. So um, sport uh, in the Middle East has, been, uh, has become an area of major interest in the media, but also in academia. And one of the reasons, uh, of course, is the awarding of the FIFA 2022 World Cup to Qatar, the first uh, FIFA World Cup in the Middle East. And by the way, there have not been that many countries that have ever hosted the FIFA World Cup. Qatar will become the 18th country that has ever hosted the FIFA World Cup, which is taking place since the early 1930s. Uh, but there are more reasons than just the FIFA 2022. World Cup. Uh, a number of mega sporting events have been hosted in Qatar and the Middle East. Uh, Turkey uh, hosted the uh, uh, European UEFA Champions League final, for example, in 2005. All the Liverpool fans will remember because Liverpool was 3 0 down and still won. Um, there is a Formula One in uh, Bahrain and uh, Abu Dhabi. And um, uh, now, even uh, European Football League start uh, hosting. Uh, uh, matches like uh, the Super Cup uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. So there's a lot going on in this region. But on the other hand, uh, there are also a number of uh, uh, ownerships and sponsorships in, uh, in European uh, football particularly. Uh, most discussed uh, Qatar's uh, ownership of Paris Saint-Germain and uh, 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 the ownership of Manchester City by Abu Dhabi. Uh, but in addition, there are also a number of sponsorships, uh, mainly by um, uh, uh, airlines from um, Abu Dhabi and Dubai, but also Qatar Airways was for some years, as you might remember, sponsor of FC Barcelona. So uh, these uh, uh, both development hosting uh, mega sporting events in the Middle East, but also Middle Eastern sponsorships in European football particularly, have led to an increased uh, attention in media, but also in the academia uh, on uh, sport in the Middle East. And a number of uh, publications that have recently uh, been published particularly uh, deal with Qatar. So there's a growing body of scholarship particularly on Qatar, and I have contributed myself with publications to this uh, growing body of scholarship. Now, I think this is a great book. You might be surprised that I say this since I'm one of the editors. Um, but really, I really think, I, I, I read it word by word, the so 284 pages in the last week to prepare for this talk. And I think one of the reasons why it is a great book is the research process, which is so different from other edited volumes. Um, so CIRS uh, hosted two workshops in 2017. This is their uh, standard procedure, I believe. So uh, the first workshop uh, invited leading scholars in the field to discuss gaps in the scholarship. So which I think is an innovative approach, not just to present what people have already worked on to identify gaps in the scholarship. And then after that workshop, uh, topics were assigned to the participants and they had to write papers 
before the second workshop, the papers were distributed among the participants. And now that's the difference to a normal journal article when I would submit a paper to an academic journal, I get two reviews. Here I got around 20 reviews because around 20 people would tell me their comments. Uh, and so after the second workshop, everybody would revise the papers and I and Tamir Sorek uh, would then uh, in uh, interaction uh, with the authors do the final touches on the chapter. So I think this is a great process and I'm very grateful to CIRS for initiating it and um, giving me the opportunity to, to be part of it. Um, now, this is uh, uh, the, 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 um, the scholars being involved in the project uh, have different backgrounds from the humanities, from the social sciences. So we have professors in political science and sociology, in history, in sport management, in physical education. So there was like a broad range of uh, scholarly backgrounds. And this also applies to the methods being used uh, in uh, the um, individual chapters. So um, uh, some uh, chapters would be based on ethnographic work. Uh, some chapters would be based on a review of the academic literature and press articles. Others would be based on archival work. Um, uh, many articles, uh, many chapters are based on, on interviews. Some are based on surveys. So there's a broad range of methods uh, being used in the 10 chapters. Um, and the, the research question uh, being asked, uh, uh, what led to the uh, uh, establishment of sport in the Middle East? Are there common patterns, common dynamics? What is uh, a different role of sports in the Middle East? And is sport also serving uh, societal change in the region? Now, what I will do now is um, I will uh, talk about uh, uh, all the chapters briefly. Uh, the book is somehow divided in two parts. The second part is dealing more with uh, politics and economics of sport, while the first part is uh, what we call sport as a contested terrain where, terrain where struggles over meaning, resources, and rights are fought. Um, uh, we are not sure anymore who, who did the pictures, but they are great, so much credit to the, to the photographer. Um, the first um, chapter is by uh, Murad Yildiz, an historian from Skidmore College, and uh, asks the question, um, what led to the establishment of sport in the Middle East? He's covering the period from uh, the 1890s to the 1930s, and um, it's based on archival uh, work, um, and the book has 13 figures, they are all in this chapter. Um, so uh, some would like show uh, uh, newspaper pages from like new sports magazines uh, or sports sections in newspapers. There are also pictures from university archives like we see university students from American University of Cairo playing basketball for example. So the, the, the pictures are great. And um, so what led to the establishment of sport in the Middle East? It's the three M's, uh, merchants, um, militaries uh, and missionaries. And when talking about missionaries, uh, this also means education. And the Syrian Protestant College, as AUB was named uh, uh, before, was essential in the establishment of basketball in Lebanon, for example. So um, uh, sport occurred first mainly in urban areas, like in Istanbul, in Tehran, in Cairo, in Beirut, in Damascus. Um, and there was like a different dynamic uh, when we look at, at gender uh, that uh, men mainly played football and basketball while uh, women particularly were in, into gymnastics. And um, so this is the first chapter. Then um, we have the second chapter by um, Doug Tuastad on football's role in how societies remember the symbolic wars of Jordanian-Palestinian football. This is based on uh, ethnographic research. Uh, Professor Tuas Dutt um, uh, went for many years to uh, matches from uh, the uh, football team from Amman, Wechtat, uh, which represents the Palestinian community. And um, there's a big rivalry in uh, Jordanian football with Wechtat and uh, Faisal. And so the one representing the Palestinian and the other the 
yeah, Jordanian Bedouin uh, community. And so um, uh, I think one cannot print all the chants that are being made at the matches, but uh, the uh, Faisali fans, for example, would uh, suggest uh, the king to divorce uh, Queen Rania, while the Palestinian fans would ask to give birth to more children uh, that the Palestinians can take over the country. So, uh, I mean, he's giving more examples of such chants. And, but the main argument of the chapter is that, um, uh, that uh, uh, this football club is... Um, the main arena for Palestinians in Jordan to express Palestinianness. There are no museums, uh, the history of Palestine is not covered in school. So, so this club has really an enormous meaning for Palestinians uh, in the country. And the club is, by the way, pretty successful. I checked the number of trophies they won uh, yesterday when preparing for the talk. Faisal, he has won slightly more, but uh, Wechtat has done pretty well in the past. Um, so this chapter is on like uh, Palestinianness. The next chapter is on competing definitions of Israeliness. Uh, Tamir Sorek from the University of Florida, he, he wrote a, a fantastic book on uh, Arab football in Israel. He's an exceptional scholar. And this is a very original work that he has done based on um, service uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, interviews uh, where he is portraying the Hapoel Tel Aviv fans. So usually when we read about Israeli football fans uh, in newspapers, we read about Beta Jerusalem fans and their racist chants against Arabs, against Muslims. What is less known is that there's not only this right-wing club, there's also a left-wing club, which is Hapoel Tel Aviv. And uh, Hapoel, as I learned, uh, uh, in Hebrew, it means worker. And um, uh, so um, when, when Hapoel Tel Aviv fans would travel to European matches abroad, they would have posters, for example, uh, we are not Israel. So they would distance themselves from Israel. And um, the club uh, has been privatized in the 1990s, but was uh, bought back partly by the fans. So the basketball uh, um, branch of the club is bought now uh, is now owned 100% by fans and the football uh, uh, brand 20% and um, and but honestly what was a little bit weird for me as somebody who was originally from Germany uh, they have a weird way of chance when they play against their local rival Maccabi Tel Aviv because they chant that they wish them a holocaust and uh, so they use Nazi terminology uh, to um, uh, uh, against their local rivals, which is a little bit weird, and uh, there are more details uh, in the chapter on what they what they chant everything, uh, but I didn't know that before. And um, but overall, uh, uh, Tamir is arguing that um, uh, 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 in, 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 in that uh, the way like uh, uh, Hapoel Tel Aviv fans would like uh, uh, their chants, their identity would also show that like uh, Israel liberal secularism is in a times of crisis and that uh, many uh, liberal secularist people distance themselves from the Israeli state. Now, the next chapter is uh, uh, an anthropologist from uh, uh, Norway, uh, uh, Charlotte Lisser, and uh, uh, her chapter is entitled Qatari female footballers negotiating gendered expectations. I just checked yesterday uh, when preparing for the talk the FIFA Women's World Ranking. Uh, does anybody know Qatar's rank? Qatar is not ranked at the moment, which means that uh, the Qatar national team has not been active since more than 18 months. But this does not mean that there is no female football in uh, Qatar. And particularly here in Education City, uh, many female students play football. And this is what the chapter is about. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Charlotte, uh, who interviewed uh, 30 uh, female football players, uh, argues that uh, women are looking for safe spaces, which they find in Education City, for example, 
where they can play in ladies-only environments. Because the problem is, I know myself, many years ago I interviewed uh, the coach of the then coach of the Qatar national women's team, uh, who was German, and uh, she said that always when she went to schools and invited girls to come to the practice of the national team, many of them would not show off at the end. Because there would be like issues with that they might not tell at home or maybe parents would not be comfortable. And so, so, but again, it doesn't mean that women doesn't want to play football, but they want to play it in like safe, safe, safe environments, in a, a ladies only environment. And that's the main argument of the chapter is a great chapter by Charlotte. And finally, um, uh, Nida, Nida uh, Ahmed came all the way from New Zealand to the two workshops and um, uh, her methodology was to do a digital ethno ethnography, a term I didn't know before, which means to follow people on their social media for a certain period of time. And, but also she, um, so she followed some female athletes and she wanted to inquire how do present, uh, how, how do female athletes in in Middle Eastern country present themselves to the public on their social media channels. Um, and uh, so um, she found many similarities to Western athletes like that they would use this for self-branding and to raise awareness on the sport, but they would uh, present themselves in a culturally more appropriate manner I mean, Western women, some Western athletes tend to present themselves on social media half naked. So uh, that's uh, what would not happen uh, here. Also, I have to say, she, the, the athletes she followed were from like more conservative Middle Eastern countries. If she would have included maybe a Lebanese female athlete, it might have been different. Um, now, the second part of the book deals more with politics and economics of sport. And... Um, Chapter uh, six is by uh, Craig Lamey. Uh, Craig is here. Could you could you identify yourself? So um, now it's dangerous to summarize a chapter in the presence of an author, but I try my best. So uh, when we when we think about uh, Qatari media and sport, of course we first think about B and sports. My running gag is like other people need uh, bread and water for survival. I need B and sports. I watch it a lot. And all my German friends are so jealous because they need four different subscriptions to follow all the different sporting events. I just need one subscription because we in sports holds all the rights. So, but the chapter is not limited to sports media. It discusses in general like the legal framework uh, of media, um, for the media in, in Qatar. And uh, based on conversations with newspaper editors and uh, a review of the legal framework and, and like existing literatures, but also taking into consideration international uh, indexes on indexes on, on freedom of press, um, uh, Craig asked the question whether uh, uh, the World Cup might lead to, um, to a liberalization of media in the country. And uh, he argues uh, that uh, uh, Qatar is responsive and respect, uh, receptive to critics and it will liberalize, but on its own terms. So it won't become like a second Norway or a Finland, but it will liberalize, and, um, uh, but on its own terms. And if you have more questions on this, uh, Craig is certainly willing to, to answer questions in the Q&A later on. The next chapter was by... Um, uh, Professor Tinatz from uh, Istanbul Birgi University. Uh, he's not here, but a colleague from Istanbul Birgi University is here <laughs> uh, because she participated in the, in the football in the Middle East workshop in the last two days. And uh, Sham looks at Turkish sport politics in uh, at the time of uh, the AK AKP, which governs Turkey since 2002. And he did a number of interviews, and he also interviewed uh, former s Turkish sport ministers. And um, uh, to, to identify and find out what are the priorities of s Turkish sport uh, politics. And he, his argument is that Turkey focuses on like large, on mega sporting events, hosting mega sporting events, focuses on like 
building big stadiums, focusing on elite sports success by having very generous monetary rewards for winning Olympic medals or medals at world championships. And, but he also says that Turkey neglects to uh, support grassroots sports. And Professor uh, Tinas is not only a professor for sport management, he's also a board member of the Turkish Tennis Federation. So he could share some insights, and one of them is that the Turkish Fe Tennis Federation has only 5,000 registered players, which is not much in a country of 80 million people. And the, the, also the number of sport cl clubs in general is very low. So uh, he, he, he argues that Turkish uh, sport politics should like more focus on, on grassroots sports than on just the elite level. Um, Professor Nassif um, uh, from Notre Dame University, Lebanon, his, his father is a colleague at uh, AUB in mathematics. Um, uh, Professor Nassif from Notre Dame University is discussing um, uh, uh, developing a national elite sport policy in, a, in an Arab country, the case of Lebanon. Uh, he um, he uh, relies on two uh, scholarly models that uh, explain elite sports success of countries. One is called the Spliss model by a Belgian researcher, De Boscher, and the other one is called the Weiss formula, developed by myself. And uh, based on these two models, he is discussing Lebanon's performance in elite sport. And he makes some uh, interesting comparison because he says that um, Estonia, Georgia, the country, not the state in the US. Estonia, Georgia, and Jamaica have uh, smaller populations and lower GDPs than Lebanon, but are more successful in international sport. And this is because of policy failures and corruption and the lack of auditing of how resources are being spent. And um, so it's a very critical contribution. Um, then, uh, the next chapter is by myself on the legacies of mega sporting events in developing countries. It's also on Lebanon. And the motivation for this chapter was is that there's a lot of academic literature on mega sporting events, but a uh, vast majority of them is looking at two events only, the Summer Olympic Games and the FIFA World Cup. But the FIFA World Cup, as I already mentioned, Qatar will be the 18th country that is ever hosting it. The Summer Olympic Games have been only hosted by 24 countries in the past. So why is all the academic literature about two events that a vast majority of countries will never be able to host? So that's why I thought it's interesting to look at what one could consider a tier two, tier three mega sporting events and how do they affect countries. So I looked at the four mega sporting events that were hosted by Lebanon after uh, the end of Lebanon's civil war. Uh, it was in 1997 the Pan Arab Games. It was in 2000 the AFC Asian so Cup, so the Continental Soccer Championship. It was in 2009 the Francophone Games, and in 2017 the FIBA Asian Cup, so the Continental Basketball Championship. By the way, uh, in 2009 at the Francophone Games, uh, I had just arrived in Lebanon and I, I badly wanted to go to the events. I tried to find out online where can I buy tickets. I didn't find any information. I later realized I could just go into the events uh, without buying a ticket. And um, so the, um, uh, how do I, uh, uh, I look at, um, uh, my methodology is I look at the tangible and intangible um, uh, uh, effects of the events. So uh, tangible, particularly the facilities that are being built. And here we can see that all over the world when new facilities are being built for mega sporting events, they mainly deal with the question how does the facility serve communication purposes. So in Lebanon for the AFC Asian Cup in 2000, uh, two new st stadiums were being built, one in Saida and one in Tripoli, and they were both built directly at the Mediterranean to have beautiful TV pictures show showing like Lebanon is a place where you can make uh, a nice vacation at the sea. Um, the problem is that uh, one of the stadiums uh, in Tripoli was not needed at all because the local football club has a stadium. And uh, since 2000, maybe there were maybe 20, 25 events in that stadium. So this is what is called in the literature a white elephant. So it, it's a facility being built, but there is no really need for it. So uh, Lebanon lacked um, 
a, a post-event management strategy. It was like just focusing on the event itself. And this is important to learn for other countries when hosting events also to have like a post-event management system uh, in place, which was not the case in Lebanon. I interviewed a number of people for this research from uh, sports federations, uh, sports journalists, sports scholars, and they were all quite negative and said that uh, sporting events in a country like Lebanon would be just a tool for corruption. What I learned from, research, from the research that corruption is not just taking place in the construction process, but also later on when it comes to maintenance. For example, the main stadium in Lebanon as a sports city stadium where the national football team is always playing, has an annual maintenance budget from $850,000. Everybody who has ever been in the stadium, it's dirty, the seats are loose, so that's why some throw them. So, I mean, this maintenance money is obvious uh, that it's not properly spent. So that's why uh, all the people I interviewed were very negative and said uh, uh, maybe a country like Lebanon that is an oil corruption index is not doing well should uh, not end up hosting such events because if there's corruption in general, why should it be absent in sports? Uh, however, I think uh, 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 Lebanon uh, uh, might be, uh, uh, we have a new trend in hosting uh, uh, sporting events, which is co-hosting. So um, uh, we had the European Football Championship being hosted by, like Belgium and Holland, for example. We have the 2026 FIFA World Cup hosted by US, Canada, Mexico. We had European handball basketball championships being hosted by three, four, five countries. So why could not countries also in this part of the world co-host? Why could not Qatar, for example, host a world championship and then give few matches to a country like Lebanon? That might be an alternative uh, approach. Last but not least, uh, Professor Simon Chadwick, who is also here. Could you please identify yourself? Um, uh, uh, Professor Shadwick and I uh, um, have a miserable life because uh, we share the fact that our favorite teams went down to the second league. Uh, Professor Shadwick is a Middlesbrough fan and I'm a Hanover 96 fan, so we are both going through hard times. Um, but uh, apart from this, uh, Professor Shadwick contributed a great chapter to this book entitled The Business of Sport and the Golf Corporation Council in Member States. And he provided a statistical profile for all the six countries. How large is the sports business in the country when it comes to, to, um, to overall um, uh, uh, revenue of the, of the industry, uh, to employment? And um, so uh, two issues I found uh, 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 interesting. One is the uh, argument that... Um, that's a, a big interest in sports, um, that consumption is mainly taking place on TV but not, does not transform into like attendance of like local football matches. Even uh, Saudi Arabia, which is a huge country, has only an average attendance of around 7,000 of local football matches in the first league. In Qatar, we just had a match some days ago with 11,000 people watching, but there are also many matches with, with much lower attendance. So, that's like one challenge to transform the interest that is definitely present um, uh, into like following the local teams and not just watching Barcelona, Madrid, uh, Juventus Turin, Bayern Munich, uh, 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 Red Star, Belgrade, um, uh, Ilya, a former student of mine who works now for the World Cup Committee, is a hardcore Red Star Belgrade fan. So everybody's following his, his team. Um, but so uh, how to generate more interest for the local teams. That's a big issue. And, um, and, um, um, uh, and uh, another important point I think you raised was that uh, the uh, sports industries in the GCC are uh, mainly state-driven. So, for example, all the football clubs in Qatar belong to the government. And so you're arguing like one main challenge for the future is to have more private involvement into uh, the sports industry. Professor Shedwick is also uh, more than happy to answer questions in the Q&A. Uh, finally, um, um, I would just like sum up and uh, uh, conclude uh, what uh, Professor Sorek and I uh, wrote in the last uh, paragraph uh, of uh, the introduction 
that the common thread in this volume is that sports in the Middle East are much more than an interesting angle uh, through which to popularize academic themes. They are themselves a major political and economic force that not only reflect but also shape both individuals' lives and large-scale social processes. With saying this, I would like to, to thank the uh, Center for International and Regional Studies, uh, Meran Kamrava and Sarah Baba and Susi Mirgani, uh, who was of great help in the editing process, um, for making uh, this uh, book and the process that led to it possible. Thank you very, very much. serving economic uh, purposes, but also like geostrategic uh, aims. And uh, I mean, particularly in times of the blockade, I think uh, the World Cup is a very valuable instrument for Qatar as a form of protection and uh, uh, as an investment into its national security. You want me to finish the answer tonight? <laughs> That's uh, quite a lot of questions. I, I think from my, my personal perspective, um, Qatar introduced me to the Middle East and Qatar brought me closer to Islam and Qatar helped me to understand the way that people live their lives in this region. And so, although I am English and the English media in particular have a very particular view of, of how things are, not just in Qatar, but across the region, um, I have learned to understand and appreciate and value uh, the people I know here and, and, and the culture and um, environment in which I've worked. So it's not all bad from a personal point of view. But I, I think there are, there are several ways in which I would answer. The, the, the first one is that sport is a great enabler. And, and this is not just true in Qatar, it's true in lots of different countries. So if you look at Athens 2004, Athens needed a new metro system. So just build a new metro system. What's the problem with that? Just build a new metro system. But it wasn't until they won the right to host the Olympic Games that they built a new metro system. Mm. So therefore, sport very often, you might call it vanity, I prefer to call it lubrication. It helps to lubricate decisions, it helps to enable decisions. And in terms of Qatar, why not just build infrastructure? Just build infrastructure. You don't need the, the, uh, the World Cup. You don't need the World Athletics Championships. Just build the infrastructure. But of course you can't because there are political differences, there are bureaucratic constraints, et cetera, et cetera. So again, um, sport helps to enable. It's interesting that, that I, I walked up to the Education City Stadium before the event tonight and... Uh, I saw an awful lot of people working incredibly hard to try and get the stadium ready for the World Club Cup in, in December. Now, I think the pace of construction would have been considerably slower if there wasn't an impending event. And I, I know that's a very specific sporting example, but I, I, I do think it helps to illustrate, again, that sport is a great enabler. But what I, what I fa have found interesting, impressive about Qatar and Qatari policy and strategy in sport, uh, which is also evident, I have to confess, in, in my other great passion, which is, which is China. And I think there are uh, some significant um, similarities that can be, and, and some comparisons that can be drawn between Qatar and China, is the scale of vision and the way in which strategically you see, Qatar sees, China sees uh, the role that sport plays. So there, there is something about uh, economy and industry and business. And, and my friend Gerard from uh, Jossor Institute is here and we did some work three or four years ago. Uh, there are something like 70,000 people working in the sport industry in the, in, in the GCC. Um, the economy is worth around $7 billion. So there, there, are, there, are, there are jobs, there are taxes, there are export earnings and so forth that are generated by sport. And so I think there is an economic purpose to, to doing what you do. To a certain extent here, it links to tourism strategy. Uh, and and if, if you look at the Qatar um, tourism uh, strategy, a lot of that is linked to sport. 
So it's, it's not just sport for sport's sake, it's a driver of other, other sectors. But as you say, if we, from my Western perspective, Qatar is strategically vulnerable. You've got a big sea coast, you have one border, that border is, is with a country which is big and powerful. You've also got to the, to the east of you another country which is big and powerful. And effectively what Qatar is doing is it's using sport not just for a tram network or a rail network or to create jobs. You're embedding yourself in a, in a sporting landscape which I think provides a degree of security. And then beyond that, and you'll see this in the chapter, there, there, there are other things like um, issues around health and active lifestyle. Qatar has the highest rate of teenage diabetes in the world. And that is a public health issue. And public health issues cost money. And so what you're doing is you're spending on sport to try and promote healthy, active lifestyles, sports participation. And one would hope that that would prompt young Qatari people to become fitter, healthier. They become more productive when they, they move to adult life. If they're more productive, obviously they spend more and so on and so forth. So is it worth the money? I don't know. <laughs> but is there, are, are there arguments to justify the investment? Absolutely. And, and, and I think that my view is Qatari should be yeah. proud and optimistic about what you're doing. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the questions you asked should be asked by thoughtful, responsible journalists. And uh, when Daniel was talking about the three M's, uh, in modern sports, military, missionaries, and merchants. Traditionally, there's a fourth, and that's media. There was an article in the New Yorker last week about the kerfuffle between the National Basketball Association and China. And in that article, it mentioned Qatar in the same breath as it did China and Russia. And Qatar is not China or Russia. It's a completely different state. But you can't still have your story being told by the New York Times and the Guardian. It needs to be told. All the nuanced questions you ask need to be reported thoughtfully by journalists here. 